hello there. Uh, here we go. Another tour. Today's a very long-awaited one. Uh, this is Harlem, baby. We're going to be doing a tour of Harlem today. Going to be showing you and telling you a little story of the, of the neighborhood, the history, talk about the current issues and all that stuff. Going to be a pretty good one. Are you ready for this, Eric? I'm ready for this. Good, because it is hot as hell today. Holy Lord, we chose probably the worst day possible. We're sweating, baby. Eric's wearing all black, so he's going to be dying by the end of this thing. I don't know why I'm wearing this over shirt, but uh, you know, I thought it'd be smart to not get my arms roasted. I gotta keep it now for continuity, the whole damn shoot. Uh, but it should be a great shoot, I'm really excited. Uh, Eric, uh, before we start, uh, guys, please don't forget the Patreon, check it out. There's tons of different levels you can join, any bit helps. That's what helps fund these things, helps improve these things. Uh, you know, trying to grow this thing, baby. We gotta, we gotta get the message out there. Uh, also to like and subscribe. <clears throat> Uh, that helps bump us in the analytics, you know, above all the, uh, you know, uh, professional slam dunkers, uh, which are actually kind of cool, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't knock them. Uh, how about ahead of all the, you know, uh, hamster fails? Those are popular videos. I don't know. I guess those are the things that are popular. But anyways, do that. Like it. Subscribe. Patreon. There's extras on the Patreon, by the way. Uh, you know, mostly PG, you know. Uh, so yeah, once you do that, great. Now. Today, we're gonna to be covering the history of Harlem, baby. It has gone from basically, you know, farmland to one of the, you know, most sought after neighborhoods in uh, New York City today. But, uh, but we're gonna talk about all that. We're gonna talk about everything as we go. Eric, should we just start this thing? Especially since that siren's coming. So, le so let's do it, baby. <laughs> Nice hot coffee, even though it's hot as hell today. Uh, all right, land it. Don't worry, I'll pick that up after. Uh, anyways, I'm here at the first stop to start the story of Harlem. In 1650, well, first of all, this is uh, called Hamilton Grange, but I'll get to that in a second. In 1658, New Harlem was actually named, and it was this area up here where we are today. It was spelled N-I-E-W, and then Harlem like the town Harlem in the Netherlands. Oh, H-A-A-R-L-E-M. It's a town that was famous for putting up a big fight against the Spanish in the 80s, 80, 80 Years' War. Uh, an 80 Years' War, it's a long time. Uh, you know, it's the kind of thing where you're like, your granddaddy fought in the 80 Years' War, your daddy fought in the 80 Years' War, and you're going to fight in the 80 Years' War. New Harlem, open, built as a place by this guy, Peter Stuyvesant. We've talked about him in past videos. This was actually lots of farmland. People used to just come out here, and they'd, they'd have little estates and hang out and relax. And it was up here in 1776 where George Washington uh, won the Battle of Harlem Heights on September 16th. It was actually kind of a really small battle. I covered that in past videos. I actually covered that in the Morris Jumel Mansion video. Check that out. Uh, but it was like a, a boost of morale before uh, Washington was finally booted out of the island of Manhattan and New York uh, and left it for the British to take over as the headquarters for the Revolutionary War. Anyways, not to dwell too much on that, this area was all farmland. That's the moral. It's all farmland all the way through the early 1800s, and that's why we're here. This is called Hamilton Grange. In 1802, this guy named Alexander Hamilton, oh, you've heard of him from the Lin-Manuel Miranda uh, play uh, that no one can afford to go to. But uh, he actually built this in 1802 as like his country estate. Pretty cool, he used to come out here with his family and stuff. Didn't get to enjoy it for too long because two years later in 1804, he dies in a duel with Aaron Burr. Uh, moral of the story, don't duel people if you're not ready to die. Uh, so uh, it's still here, pretty cool. Uh, Eliza Hamilton lived here for a little bit longer. She actually took a place down on St. Mark's Place, which I've covered on the St. Mark's video and East Village video. I'm plugging these away, baby. This is very important stuff. You got to watch these videos. This is cross pollination. Is that what, what it's called, Eric? Cross contamination. Cross, yeah, contamination. I feel like that's a that's a little bit of a dig, but all right, I'll take it. Anyways, uh, this was for uh, Hamilton, so it, it continued on. And interesting thing about this uh, house, it was actually moved twice. In 1889, it was moved the first time. And then recently, in 2008, it was moved a few blocks from here. They actually lifted it up on stilts, brought it down, and put it on wheels, and actually drove it, pretty much, down to this new spot. It was a sandwich in between two buildings. Pretty nuts. People would just, like, gather and, like, drink their coffees and watch this giant house be wheeled down the street. That's a pretty cool thing. Uh, good thing there was no Instagram back then. That's very, uh, you know, like, people would be doing this in front of the, you know, moving house. 
But uh, pretty cool, pretty cool here in St. Nicholas Park is its final resting place. But this was the beginnings of Harlem. It was, uh, it was a, a farmland, it was actually outside of the city for a very long time, and it was a couple things that kind of made it start coming into the modern era uh, in the mid-1800s, which we'll talk about at our next stop. What do you think, Eric? Should we go? I think we should go. That was a pretty concise little beginning to this, huh? We're learning a lot already. All right, well then let's go to the next spot. <laughs> Okay, so now I'm here at the next spot. We are on 138th Street uh, in what is called today Strivers Row, uh, which is uh, made up of 138th Street and 139th Street between Frederick Douglass and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard. Uh, I'm here to talk about the next phase of Harlem's development. So we were talking about how it used to be farmland, right? Well, in the 1800s, New York City started to develop, right? 1811, you have the, the commissioner's plan. The grid of New York is starting to be implemented, right? All the streets are numbered off. It's like, oh, New York's going to be developed. How great. Very important day, by the way, 1811. Got to remember the grid plan. Then you had in 1837, the Harlem Railroad comes all the way up here, right? This is an overground, uh, you know, steam railroad, nothing too fancy, but it made its way up here, which is a kind of big deal. Uh, so people start coming out here. Uh, by 1878, you had an elevated railway coming up here, which is also a big deal. So this kind of brought people out to this area uh, for the first time, uh, specifically people like uh, the Germans, the Germans. <laughs> Yeah, ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. Uh, but there's actually still some, uh, some uh, you know, some churches. There's a church over on 125th that still dates back to when the Germans were here. Uh, so, so people kind of start coming in. And because of that, people start speculating. We're on this street in this area called Strivers Row because a man named David H. King uh, used it to kind of make a little development to kind of for the upwardly mobile. He called it the, the, the King Model Houses. And it's basically two blocks of nice houses developed by some nice uh, architects at the time. In fact, the north end of 139th was developed by Stanford White, who was one of the most famous architects in New York City history. He's actually famous for dying on top of his own creation, which was Madison Square Garden. Yeah, the second Madison Square Garden. He got shot and killed by a jealous husband of a woman he used to date. Date. He was a, kind of a creep too, by the way. I cover this in my video. You should check out the video on Stanford White. All right. Uh, but David King was kind of like this big shot, like real estate guy back then. So it was this really big deal, like, oh, I'm developing this thing. He had developed uh, the New York Times headquarters. He had developed the, the base to the, the Statue of Liberty. He had developed the Madison Square Garden. So big deal, right? Problem was 1893, there was the panic of 1893, big like depression, recession type thing. It's a complete failure, unfortunately. Yeah, it kind of stunk. Um, so he gets foreclosed on in 1895 by the Equitable Assurance uh, Society. Yikes, yeah, that's kind of embarrassing. A little egg on his face, but they hold on to it. They still restrict it to only white people until 1919 when the pressure was just too great and there were more and more black people moving in the neighborhood. Uh, they open it up and it becomes the upwardly mobile of the African-American community that move here. Uh, people like uh, Louis T. Wright, who was the first attending physician at a, any city hospital here at Harlem Hospital, People like U.B. Blake, W.C. Handy, Fletcher Henderson, uh, a lot of jazz musicians. I always feel sorry for jazz musicians because, you know, they work so hard and they're so technically proficient. And then if they're successful one day, then people listen to their music while shopping for pants at Macy's. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, unfortunately, where a lot of jazz music ends up. Uh, but anyways, uh, this area too. Also, Bob Dylan owned a house here up until recently. In like the early 2000s, he sold it. Um, but yeah, it was a really big, like, you know, really important uh, uh, development here for the, the African-Americans who were moving here, specifically on the Great Migration. Uh, a lot of uh, black people were migrating from the South uh, after the Civil War, well, in the early 1900s, because of the policies that were being put in place in the South. But we'll talk about that here in a little bit, and I'll talk to you guys about the Harlem Renaissance as well. What do you think, Eric? Should we keep moving? That is a truck that's slowly idling towards us. Uh, you know, you can't really plan for stuff, unfortunately. We're, it's really just me and Eric. This is what they call a guerrilla a gorilla operation. Um, one of these days, Eric, we'll have a whole team. We'll have a producer, sound person, PA. We'll have a catering truck. <sighs> a, a boy can dream. So they named this place Strivers Row because the people who were coming here were striving for a better life, and it's still called that today. Kind of cool, they named it after the people who inhabited the area. It's a good thing they didn't name my block after the people who inhabited that area uh, in, uh, in Tampa, Florida, or they would have called it, uh, you know, like Ambivalence Alley or Lazy Freak Lane. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyways, what do you think, Eric? Should we go to the next spot? Uh, we should go to the next spot. Let's do it. Yeah. 
All right, so now I'm at the corner of 135th and Malcolm X. By the way, the different avenues, that, that, like 8th Avenue, all these, they, they take on names of different black leaders who pass through Harlem at some point. People like Malcolm X, people like Adam Clayton Powell Jr., people like Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King Jr., so a little FYI. Anyways, I stopped here because of the building behind me. This is the uh, Schomburg Center for uh, Black Culture. This is actually a New York Public Library branch. You can see the original building there. It's 1903. Ah, Stanford White, look at that. Oh, go figure, modeled after the Palazzo Canossa in Verona. Okay, cool. Uh, we talked about Stanford White already. This is the newer wing. Anyways, you don't talk about anything having to do with uh, black culture in Harlem without mentioning the Schomburg Center. It's named after Arturo Schomburg. I kind of feel silly saying Arturo, it's more Arturo Schomburg. Uh, he was actually a black, black Puerto Rican who amassed a huge collection of different uh, you know, artifacts and documents and stuff. Yeah, that's loud. There we go. Yeah, yeah. I always feel guilty like getting angry when a, when a you know, ambulance is going by. I'm like, all right, hurry up there. And there's someone in there like fighting for their life. The reason that's going by is because we're next to the Harlem Hospital also, right over there, which is 1907, uh, dates back to 1907. It was one of the first hospitals to train black physicians and black nurses. Kind of cool. Martin Luther King was actually treated for a stab wound there. huh? And also Tito Puente was born there. Kind of cool. Anyways, I digress. <laughs> Okay, back to what I was saying. Schomburg Center, Arturo Schomburg amasses a huge collection. It's bought by the New York Public Library in 1926. And today they still have uh, all kinds of like exhibits and things. Right now they have one on black comics uh, and comic books and things like that. Uh, I've gone and seen ones on Motown, all kinds of cool stuff. Anywho, oh, and also too, right down the street here on 135th is the YMCA, which was one of the first places in the neighborhood to let in uh, black people to stay there as like a hotel. Uh, so people like, you know, James Baldwin, uh, Langston Hughes, Malcolm X, they all stayed at that place. And they also ran a little theater company, which actually had people like Danny Glover, Sidney Poitier, uh, Cicely Tyson all pass through its program. Man, I'm getting, I'm sidetracking. All of this to say that um, the big change here in the neighborhood that really kind of gave it its, its identity happened uh, with the Great Migration. Uh, that we're talking about from 1910 to about World War II, that's the first phase of it, when all these African Americans were coming up from, south, from the South because of all the different policies that were put in place there discriminatory policies that were put in place as a result of Reconstruction. So after the Civil War, there was a period known as Reconstruction where the federal troops inhabited the South, made sure that uh, the, the newly freed black people were given their rights, people started getting elected to different uh, state governments, etc. This pissed off the people who were down there. So in 1877, when the federal government pulled them out as the result of a compromise called the Compromise of 1877, uh, it turned bad. It became the redemption for the people in the South. That already sounds pretty bad. And that was basically where the people down there started putting in policies that uh, basically kept people down. Things like separate but equal, which were a result of Plessy versus Ferguson, a Supreme Court case in the late 1800s. Things like lynchings, over 4,400 lynchings uh, in the early half of the 1900s and late 1800s. Also, things you had things like Jim Crow laws. Uh, all kinds of horrible things that sent basically over six million uh, black people out of the South into places like New York, Detroit, etc. And they settled here because there was already a little bit of a, of a community here and it grew and grew and grew. And it became a center of black culture. So this is what was known as the Harlem Renaissance from 1924 to 1929. People like Langston Hughes, people like Zora Neale Hurston, uh, people like W.E.B. Du Bois, all these people basically, you know, and in music all over the place here as well. So it became a real hotbed of culture here in, uh, in Harlem and gave it its identity. Uh, pretty cool. And you have it all kind of documented here at the Schomburg Center. Kind of awesome. But I covered a lot there. I think uh, now we can head down to 125th, which is kind of the main drag of, uh, of the area, and, uh, and talk about that. Keep moving on, uh, on the history. What do you think? Because there's lots of culture and stuff to talk about that came as a result of uh, this new identity here in Harlem. What do you think, Eric? Should we keep moving? This is a crazy intersection, but this is what we do, man. We just park ourselves in front of a busy intersection and pretend like no one is walking around us looking at us like we're weirdos. So, uh, all right, let's keep moving. All right, now I'm on 125th Street, the main drag here in Harlem. The reason it became a main drag is because the original uh, subway put a uh, stop here on 125th, and so there you go. Uh, it, even today, it's still kind of like the main artery here. I'm actually in front of the Apollo Theater, which dates back to 1913. I was telling you that there were immigrants and people coming out here uh, as, 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 uh, you know, as long ago as like the 18, late 1800s with the Germans and then Jews 
In fact, this was actually a theater. It was called Hertig and Siemens in 1913. Uh, still, it was still only white people. It was only allowed for white people. In 1924, it was taken over by the Minsky Brothers, an extremely famous uh, burlesque theater promoter, you know, group of brothers. Uh, if you don't know what burlesque is, it's like, you know, comedy, music, it's a mix of all kinds of things, like a variety show. But people really just went because it was like legal striptease, you know? It's like, it's like the people go to Hooters for the wings, you know, those people. It was big, it was very popular. Um, well. However, it was bought again in the early 1930s and then its doors opened to black people and it became the go-to theater. 1934, Amateur Night starts and they've seen everyone who's anyone in uh, black entertainment pass through. Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, Sam Cooke, uh, you know, uh, Ella Fitzgerald won the first uh, amateur night ever. Pretty cool. And it's still here, still open, still pretty great. Um, you guys don't know who those people are. I don't know if you mean like Sam Cooke is actually the guy. He sings, uh, he sings a song like, don't know much about history. Don't know much biology. You know that one, Eric? That's pretty good, right? Thank you, I should, I should sign up for amateur night. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the Apollo, and we're on 125th, which has lots of different like important spots. Right around the corner here on uh, on Adam Clayton Powell is the Teresa Towers, which uh, used to be was actually the Waldorf Astoria they called it of Harlem. Uh, it was open initially, also had its doors closed to black people until 1940 when it opened its doors, and anyone who's anyone stayed there as well. Muhammad Ali stayed there, uh, you know Malcolm X, uh, A. Philip Randolph had his offices for the March on Washington there. Uh, big deal. And also, too, Fidel Castro stayed there when he came to speak to the UN in 1960 because he got kicked out of his hotel further downtown because he had chickens in the, uh, in the hotel. Uh, so goes the show. Uh, another famous person who stayed there was Sam Cooke. You know who Sam Cooke is, Eric? No, Sam He's Cook? the guy who sings, uh, I was born by the river in a little tent. Oh, that was pretty good. Another Sam Cooke song. Okay, well anyways, those are just two of the ones that are right near where we are. I'm going to move up a little bit on one, I'm going to go east on 125th, and we're going to talk about the most recent uh, issue here, because as the neighborhoods changed, this street has also changed. This was always a huge, uh, very important uh, drag where people sell their stuff on the street, all kinds of things, but today it's struggling from something else, and that is gentrification. We'll talk about that at our next stop. Uh, you ready for that, Eric? I am ready for it. Real pick-me-up. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so I'm here on 125th Street to talk to you guys about the present day and more recent times here in Harlem. Now, obviously, without, it goes without saying that there has been tension here in the past, even though this has been a hotbed and a refuge for blacks escaping persecution in other parts of the country. For example, in 1935, a black Puerto Rican boy was shot for stealing a penknife from a local store. It incited a riot. 1943, a black serviceman was shot in an altercation here. A riot ensued because of the way black servicemen were being treated after World War II and their service. And then in 1964, uh, a young black boy was shot while he was arguing with a landlord by a bystander who just got involved and that incited another riot. You know, this, this uh, people died, uh, a lot of people injured. There's still tension there. And I bring this up to say that today there is still issues here as well. And it's important because this isn't something that's happening just in Harlem. And I'm talking about the G word, gentrification. <laughs> Ooh, baby, this is a sticky issue, but uh, there's some important things to cover before we move on. If some of you guys are watching, you're like, oh, look at your dumb beard, Tom, and your hat. You're just a gentrifier anyway. Well, first of all, relax, okay? Second of all, gentrification is not as simple as just some people moving into a neighborhood. These are city policies. These are city policies geared to benefit a certain group. That's what it is, and that's what I think is the important takeaway. The city dictates our day-to-day -day lives. Most people don't get involved in city politics because they think the federal is most important. A good example is here on 125th Street. Now, this has undergone a couple policies that have changed it a lot. One was in 1994, they designated this area uh, the Upper Manhattan uh, Empowerment Zone based on federal legislation. What that did was it created a body that got public funds that could then distribute it to uh, certain groups to come in and develop the neighborhood. Now, as cities have lost federal spending, I'm sorry, federal funds over the years, which they have, uh, it was slashed during the Reagan administration, has been slashed ever since, they've been kind of left to fend for themselves and rely on taxes. Now, this is uh, kind of bad because it means that you cater to people who pay more taxes or who are bigger tax base, which usually are wealthier individuals and bigger companies. Uh, now, you may be thinking, well, what's the problem with that? They have deeper pockets, whatever, but that, if a city was 
important just because of the amount of money it had, then that would be okay. But a city is more than that. A city is nothing if it isn't a mix of people and diversity and different opinions and backgrounds. That's what's made New York great throughout history. And it's something that needs to continue for it to be a viable city. Uh, that being said, other things have happened, and you can see behind me the construction. This points to what's going on today. Now, rezoning is kind of the tool today that used to be urban renewal in the past when they would just demolish you know, slums and then build up highways or whatever. Today, it's rezoning, and what they do is they rezone neighborhoods that are uh, derelict or, or lower you know, in value, which is what gentrification is, uh, because there's more profit to be had in neighborhoods that are you know, a little more depressed. They basically go into these neighborhoods and they rezone them for high density uh, to be able to make more money off them because the value is so low and the city is kind of booming currently, right? So what that leads to is out of scale development. You have big condos, big office buildings that are geared towards people with money. And this kind of tips the scales of a neighborhood very quickly in favor of those with more resources without taking care of the people with less resources because they are not profitable but they are still important to the city. So that's one of the issues you have here today. So Harlem today is changing very, very quickly. Another thing that happens is uh, small businesses suffer because the rents get so high, it doesn't matter how many empanadas a business sells, they can't afford the rent. So the only people who can afford the rent are big businesses like banks, big businesses like chain restaurants, et cetera, because they can pay those. And they also get tax breaks themselves because they have deeper pockets, because they bring up the value in a neighborhood. However, they don't contribute to the community the way a small business does. So you can see how these policies are counterproductive to what a city needs sometimes. So it's important to know this. You, I think it's important to educate yourself on this and know that it happens at a city level. You gotta participate. You know, there are community boards, there are different nonprofits you can get involved in. Uh, and like I said, you know, just realizing it is, uh, you know, a step in the right direction, uh, you know. Uh, so there you have it. What do you think, Eric? Should we go and wrap this thing up? Yeah, let's go. Let's go. All right, guys, well, we did it. We made it to the end. We made it to the end. We covered a lot, baby. Holy Lord, we started with how Harlem was farmland. Then we got into its growth throughout the 1800s, the immigrants coming out of here, the Germans, the Jews. Then we got into the uh, black community settling down here, the Great Migration. Then we got into how after World War II, the area started to become a little more depressed. And because it did, so you have what is happening today, and that is the G word, gentrification. I hate to say it, but it's true. And you know, these are all very important things to remember, but you know, that's part of the, the city. But the important thing is we all educate ourselves. We learn, we know what's going on because that's how we change things. That's how we begin to change things, even at our own little individual level. That's all this world is. It's just a bunch of little tiny dots of us and we all come together to form a whole. That's some, that's some poetry right there, huh, Eric? Yeah, that's pretty good. But there's a great quote, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, one of the Harlem Renaissance writers, uh, said, uh, there are questions that take years to ask and years to answer. And you know, that's kind of what we're going through here, you know, in New York City and in Harlem and in the world. That was pretty good. America, question mark. America, question mark. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But you know, this is, uh, this is all part of it. You learn something, we, we spend the day together, we bond, we get close. How great is that? Uh, now I gotta go home and shower because I feel absolutely disgusting. I'm, you know, I'm chafing, baby. I'm feeling, my feet are, my feet are on fire. Uh, I'm sweating. Holy Lord, I'm sweating. Uh, but if you like the video, check out the Patreon. Please, guys, if you've watched more than one, please check out the Patreon. Consider uh, contributing. That, uh, that is what, uh, the reason I can do these. I promise uh, it's worth it on there. There are some extras on there. <laughs> PG, baby. Uh, and also, too, like it, subscribe. If you watch more than one of these especially, subscribe, please. Uh, uh, you know, it's hard to grow these things, you know, especially when you make one of these videos. It takes a little bit of time, a week to do. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Anyways, uh, Eric, what do you think, man? That was pretty good, right? I learned something. Uh, I learned something, and I'm excited to check out the PG extras. The PG extras, huh? All right. Yeah, they're great. They got some good PG extras. All right, well, guys, that's it. Uh, I'm here in front of some of the brownstones of uh, Harlem. Here are near 125th. We're gonna go grab some uh, some food here afterwards and grab some uh, some uh, wings. <laughs> All right, I'm running out. I'm running out of steam here. I'm really running out of steam. All right. Well, that's it, guys. Thanks for watching. See y'all later. Sick.